good for the audio or you can even watch back Giving players all the props or put them on blast We don't give no hot takes, only talk facts We're giving all our devotion Riding high on this wave of emotion Going all out, yeah, cause this is the time No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line No, you know that we can hold it down Shout out to my man Sammy, got it off the ground And to all the listeners tuned in right now Got debates, analysis, and speculation This is sports talk for the new generation You know where to find us, got a reputation Sick podcast, your number one sports destination We're giving all our devotion Riding high on this wave of emotion Going all out, yeah, cause this is to listen to the, the sick, sick podcast. podcast sick podcast with tony maradero 55 seconds left in the penalty a minute and 27 seconds left in regulation time boston four montreal three 
Lafleur coming out rather gingerly on the right side. He gives it into Lemaire back to Lafleur. Oh! The sickest Montreal Canadiens podcast. <laughs> you know, I, 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 there is a oh! sports entertainment like no other. Rejoint, on lui fait perdre la rondelle une passe devant. Et c'est bon. Ce sera la victoire des Canadiens. Stanley pour les Canadiens. Le pack troisième de l'histoire. You found the dogs. John, you found the dogs. He found the dogs. And all together they worked a young team to the top. And now a 24th Stanley Cup banner will hang from the rafters of the famous forum in Montreal. The Canadians win the Stanley Cup. Brought to you by Energy Transportation Group. Driven to be different. TV. It's going to be sick. Marinero, the sick podcast, weeknights between 10 p.m. and 11 p.m. Live on YouTube, live on Facebook, live on Twitter. And I probably look a little bit different tonight, huh? Do, am I, do I look a little bit higher? Look at this chair. Hold on a second. Look at that. Ah, it, uh, it feels just as good as it looks. I got to tell you, I feel like a different person uh, with this podcast, of course, uh, with uh, this uh, new gamer chair. And uh, slowly but surely, I'm turning everything around in my little room here and uh, and uh, taking it to another level. So pretty excited about that. Uh, speaking of taking it to another level, the New York Rangers definitely are not doing that. And I have to tell you, even though the uh, Devils were favored by the odds makers and the Devils uh, lead game seven by a score of two to nothing, as we speak right now at 10.02 p.m. Eastern time, after two periods of play, for me, this is a choke because the Devils, they're ahead of their time. They're actually one year probably um, ahead of where they thought they would be. And the New York Rangers, who made a move to go out and get Patrick Kane, if you take a look at the Rangers players on paper, they're supposed to beat the New Jersey Devils. But the game isn't played on paper. It's played on the ice. And uh, the Florida Panthers proved that to the Boston Bruins as well. And the Seattle Kraken proved that to the Colorado Avalanche. It's becoming one of those playoff years where crazy things have happened. More crazy things will happen. And even though we shouldn't take anything for granted at this point, I myself personally, I believe that the, um, the highway is clear for the Toronto Maple Leafs. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be other cars on the highway. There will be other cars on the highway. But I believe that it's the Toronto Maple Leafs Stanley Cup to lose. And I have to tell you, and I know I'm going to get a lot of heat for this, I want to see them win the Cup. I really do. Uh, I think the uh, Stanley Cup that um, was last won by the Canadians or in you know the last Canadian team to win a Stanley Cup, that was 30 years ago this year, 30 years ago. It'll be 30 years on the 9th of June exactly, right? That's a long time. Now, many of you, most of you watching are Montreal Canadiens fans, and you want the Montreal Canadiens to be the last Canadian team to win the Stanley Cup. And I understand that, by the way. I don't have a problem with that. As a guy who's been proning rebuild, and I love the way Toronto has done the rebuild, there was something that maybe was not 100%, and that was signing John Tavares, um, going out and signing an unrestricted free agent to a seven-year, $77 million deal, when you already had at center ice Matthews and you already had Kadri and you were missing a goalie and you were missing some defense. But John Tavares has silenced any critics because a lot of people have talked about John Tavares in the National Hockey League for about 10 years. Uh, he hadn't won a playoff series. It's not, guess what? He just did. And he was the hero in round one. He scored a lot of big goals for the Toronto Maple Leafs and he scored the biggest one of the series, scoring the overtime winner on Saturday night. And Toronto... Uh, getting over the hump. I mean, the curse is over. And once I think it's their cup to lose, folks. And I take a look at those fans on Leaf Square um, in jubilation. And you know what? They deserve it. And, uh, you know, they say Stanley Cups are won at the center ice position. As I'll uh, lower my volume here with one eye on the screen. They say the Stanley Cups are won at the center ice position. And uh, which team is better than Toronto at center ice? Matthews? Tavares, O'Reilly. How about some wingers? Marner, Nylander, Bunting. It's not too shabby, eh? And on defense and goaltending, I, I think Stanley Cups, you have to learn how to win defensive hockey games the way Toronto won one 
in Game 7. But I think Stanley Cups are won, first and foremost, at the center ice position. And secondly, having a great, you know, transition defenseman. And thirdly, special teams. And fourthly, you know what? Scoring goals. And fifth, a goalie who doesn't have to be the best goalie in the league, but has to get hot at the right time. And Samsonov played his best games when they counted down the stretch. And he actually outgoaled Vasilevsky. Who would have thought that? But he did. Kemper outgoaled Vasilevsky last year. And there were years where Vasilevsky outgoaled whoever he went up against. It's a sick podcast. Brought to you in part by La Bitta TV. Embrace your true nature. Brewed in Quebec, a winner of a dozen international awards. La Bitta TV offers quality microbrewery beers made with premium ingredients for everyone's taste. La Bitta TV. Embrace your true nature. And brought to you in part by Energy Transportation Group, a leading service falls. Uh, a leading full-service logistics provider serving all of North America. They are driven to be different. For whatever reason, I, um, I'm i going to clear my throat because I'm losing my voice. Okay, that's good. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe it's because I let out a little scream earlier today. I was actually a little bit shocked, a little bit rattled um, because um, somebody hit my truck uh, while I was driving. Luckily, they hit the passenger side and there was no passenger in the vehicle. All right. In a parking lot. Someone just backed up and uh, put their foot on the gas and didn't look in their mirror. And uh, me, as I was going very slowly just to try and find the parking spot, I was straight ahead and. Let me find the parking spot. Oh, there, there's one. I'm driving and boom, like I jumped in the air type of thing and let out a scream because I'm like, what in the world just hit me? But uh, luckily, um, all's well that ends well. All right. So uh, no one was hurt and, uh, you know, the, the truck will end up getting fixed. We have our guy. I'll bring him in. Eric Engels is usually our regular collaborator. Look at this piece of work. Get ballets to this guy. Yeah, what a beauty, huh? Uh, Eric Engels is usually our regular collaborator on Mondays, and he'll join me in about less than 20 minutes' time. Joining me right now, and it's very much appreciated because, of course, he works the morning show on TSN 1050 out of Toronto, which means he's on the air at 6, which means he probably is going to wake up at around 4.30 in the morning. And here we are, 10.08 p.m., and I know he's doing it because he loves me. And I hope he knows that I'm having him on because I love him too. Carlo Kaliakovo, how are you? <laughs> Piacere, Tony. Piacere. I didn't do anything for you, buddy. We're family. Uh, I, I, well, since we're family, <laughs> Carlo, can you give me a million dollars? I got to ask my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully she considers me family as well. Yeah. Uh Carlo, I hope you're doing well. Um, you and I have continued to stay in touch over the last year, which has been very much appreciated. Um, you, you know how much respect I have for you as a person and for your work, and uh, and I thank you for coming on. So thank oh, you. I my appreciate pleasure, it. buddy. Likewise, likewise. I got to tell you, I said over the last week, I'm not going to lie to you, I said I'm going through a roller coaster of emotions, right? Why? I'll tell you why. Part of me wanted Toronto to win. And part of me wanted Toronto to lose because <laughs> Toronto not being able to pass the first round for the longest time, as much as it was painful to watch and to see, a little bit of it was actually funny. If you're not living in Toronto, you get my drift, right? So if you're yeah. not living in Toronto, you kind of like you have that over Toronto and you want to make fun of them and laugh at them for all of that. But at the same time, you see Kyle Dubas, who's done everything you can ask a general manager to do. Sheldon Keefe, who he was trying his best, but the poor guy just keeps on going up against the wrong team every year in the playoffs, yeah. right? Uh, sometimes they get a little unlucky. Sometimes they deserve to lose. Other times they get bad bounces. You've seen them blow 3-1 series leads the way they did against the Canadians a couple of years ago. You see those fans in Leaf Square gathering like every year, like just praying, God, please let it be our year this year, or at least please let it be our round. And it doesn't happen. But it happened this time around, and I'm happy that it did. Also, because uh, Raymond Singh, Singh Sign Sold, who watches the podcast live on YouTube every night. He's a uh, diehard, never misses an episode. When the series was tied at one and Toronto won game two, he said to me, 
Tampa Bay is going to win. And I said, no, they won't. Toronto's going to win. And he said, I bet you a lunch. <laughs> and we had a lunch at a very, very nice restaurant on the West Island of Montreal. So nice. I won my bet. That's another, another reason why I'm happy. Can you begin to explain what this means to Torontonians, the city of Toronto, the Maple Leafs fan base, Leafs Nation, etc.? Well, I mean, the, 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 the first thing is relief, right? Um, you know, a relief for a fan base that has suffered through so, so much pain and, you know, excruciating pain um, over the last 19 years because, you know, not only did they ha have they had to digest losses, but losses in, in the most um, difficult ways. I mean, you're talking about game seven losses, elimination losses, you know, leading in the series losses. And for the most part, it's been in years where the expectation has been through the roof. I mean, all, all that's been talked about in the Matthews and Marner era has been championships, right? But yeah, for, for a team that's failed so much to get past through the, to the first round, look, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I love my job, but it's, yeah. it's, it's been a tough job to work, you know, the last four or five years. And I can't even imagine how hard of a job it's been to actually be a player on this team the, the last four or five years because – you have great regular season, then when you get to the playoffs, you suffer the same result, which is, you know, so um, crazy to think about, you know, that a team can go through that much pain and that much suffering. So, yeah, and um, for you, Carlo, you have to go in every year come playoff right. time. You either have to criticize the GM or, or the coach and or the players or this player or that player or this player or that player. When you do it once, you do it twice as part of the job. When you're doing it five, six, seven, eight right. years in a row, it's it's tough. I mean, if, if people think that we take pleasure no. being critical of some players' performances, we don't. But at no. the end of the day, we got to call it the way we see it. You're absolutely right, and that's and that's the the difficulty and the beauty of the job is you know difficulty is you know having to you know talk about people's livelihoods, but the beauty of it is you get to talk about hockey every day for a living and. Um, you know, it's been fun talking hockey, but at this time of year, it hasn't necessarily been fun because the story has been the same. And I think for me, at least when I talk about relief, it's also refreshing because there's a newfound excitement in the job and there's a newfound excitement in this team, knowing that they finally, like the word I used a lot today on my show, which was mm -hmm. so refreshing for me, was finally. Because finally, we can talk about a team that won a playoff series. Finally, yeah. we can talk about a team that is playing in the second round. You know, finally, we can stop talking about all the things that has, has haunted this team in the past. And finally, we can start talking about this team potentially being a Stanley Cup contender, which is what they've built this team to be when they're, when they're now one of eight teams remaining to play. Um, Carlo, they're going to they're gonna win the Cup, Carlo. Carlo, they're going to well, win the Cup this year. Tony, I, I hope you're right. And, and look, I, I think for me, um, I don't really have those type of expectations. To me, I'm more of like a realist. To me, the expectation this year was just win a playoff round. Carlo, it's their I, listen, and I know that you're not setting the bar too high. You don't want to put pressure on the players or whatever. Carlo, it's their cup to lose. And, and Tony, I'm not going to sit here and disagree with you because you look yeah. at the path now, right? I mean, you yeah. have to play Boston. Um, you know, the Rangers game right now, it's two nothing Jersey. If it, if it, if it holds like this, you probably won't have to go through the Rangers. And those are the teams everybody talked about the path. To yeah. The Stanley cup. Look, the West still has some pretty good teams. They've got Vegas, they've got Edmonton, they've got Dallas, who I think can, can be, you know, strong competition, but there's no, there's no doubting this team right now because the incredible weight that has been lifted off of this team's shoulder with how much pressure they've had to play with in the first round, not just this year and previous years, like no other team and no other, no other player that has played on their teams has ever had to endure this type of pressure. And I can just imagine yeah. now that that pressure is relieved, how much more freely this team can play with the amount of skilled players. And, and you know, the best way to describe it is we always knew this team was skilled, but now the will has met up with the skill and, and, and it's, it's, exciting to see how much further this team can take it. Carlo, I would say that in the last 10 or 15 years, the National Hockey League playoffs, for the most part, have showed us that if there is one position more important than the others, it's center ice. Yeah. 
and we can look at the Boston Bruins winning the Stanley Cup as great as Chara was on defense and as great as Tim Thomas was. You had Bergeron, Krejci down the middle, uh, Kelly down the middle, not too shabby. You take a look at the St. Louis Blues and as great as uh, Bennington was and as great as Petrangelo was, uh, you had, uh, you had, of course, Ryan O'Reilly. You had Braden Shen. Uh, you had uh, you had Robert Thomas. You had Tyler Bozak. Uh, yeah. You take a look at um, you take a look Sun at the Pittsburgh Penguins. You had you had uh, Crosby and Malkin, obviously, and uh, Stahl. You, you know, and and Stahl. You take a look at the uh, Chicago Blackhawks, and and obviously Jonathan Taze was a big part at center ice. Yeah. Uh, you take a look at uh, the Los Angeles Kings, and you had Jeff Carter one year, and uh, Ansi Kopitar. I mean, the list one another year. You had Mike Richards. Uh, you take a look at Tampa Bay, and you had Braden Point, and yet Steven Stamkos, and Stamkos can also play win. And Sorelli. Long, like, and Sorelli. Long story short, that's the most important position, Carlo. Who's got three better centermen than Matthews, O'Reilly, and Tavares? Yeah, the, there's, no, there's no one that matches that, for sure. Nobody. And, and, and you know, Kyle Dubas deserves a ton of credit. As, as much as he's received a lot of the criticism over the last couple of years because of the teams that he's built – and the way he's built them, you got to give him a ton of credit for the approach that he took at this this trade deadline, knowing that the players put themselves in a position to be a great team again. But it was up to him to change the way this team was going to play come playoff time. Because if we've, if you talked about the, the, the Stanley Cup playoffs and the way the centerman is built, and the teams that have had success, if hockey has taught us anything, it is completely two different seasons when you're talking about the regular season and the playoffs, because. As good as you are in the regular season, if you don't play a certain way come playoff time, and the Montreal Canadiens are another good example of that two years ago. Yeah, right? yeah. A team that in a regular year probably wouldn't have been in the playoffs, but the way they were built because of the way they played was yeah. able to have playoff success. You know, because you, you have those type of players that are willing to sacrifice and invest in playing a certain way with their mind, their bodies, and their emotions. And, and, and you know, you, you look at Tampa Bay. The, the, yeah. Three straight runs to the to Stanley Cup Finals. They don't do it necessarily blowing every team out of the water, but they do no. it because they know how to play at the right time of year, and they have every yeah. guy that invests the same Carlo, way. He went out and he got somebody who's been there before and who did right. it before and plays that way and was able to show the others the way. Right. That is like the turning point of the season, going out and acquiring Ryan O'Reilly. Anyway, listen. Once again, anything can happen the way Florida surprised Boston. Right. They can definitely go out and surprise Toronto. But Toronto will be ready for Florida and won't underestimate Florida. And I think Boston did. And I also think Boston made a couple of mistakes along the way. Yeah. I think they put too much focus and too much onus on breaking that regular season record. They should have rested guys down the stretch. They did not do that. And, um, and, you know, plus they had a couple of injuries and Toronto's relatively healthy right now. So look, I, I love their chances. And I, you know, another reason why I'm pulling for them is I'm a big proponent of the rebuild. And when Mark Bergevin was here and I'll, I'll tell you, frankly, we had a couple of, you conversations. Were very critical of it. We, we, we had a couple of conversations. You remember I was on, I was on your radio show on more than one occasion. And I always used to say, I love what Toronto's doing with the rebuild, and I don't understand why the Canadians aren't doing it, right? Did I say that like a million yeah, times yeah. when I was on? Yeah, and you're I had a conversation with Mark Bergevin, and I and I and I on the air and off the air, and I told him, I said, I'm a big fan of the rebuild, and I don't know why you didn't do it. He never really elaborated as to why he didn't, and he said, Well, I'm doing it a certain way. And I said to him, I said, uh, well, I, I like the way others are doing it. And he said, Who like Toronto? And I said, Yes. And he said, uh, and he said, and I said, Mark, I believe they're going to win the Stanley Cup with this, with this rebuild and the players that they required through the rebuild via draft and via trade. And he said to me, he said, well, if they win it, then they were right. And they haven't won it yet. Well, they haven't won a playoff round yet. But, I, but, I, but I, I, I want them to win it. And look, I know it doesn't matter now, but I'll ask you anyway. If they get eliminated in the first round, is Dubas relieved of his duties? Um, I see, I, I was always on the fence of this and my answer was, it's not if they lose, it's how they lose. Right. If, if, if they would have went in and didn't put up a fight, then yes, I, you know, I, and I, and I, and I, I hate speculating on people's jobs, but clearly there would have been a push yeah, for, you know, a, a house cleaning. Um, if they went to a game seven again and they lost in an overtime, um, look, I, I don't blame Kyle Dubas or management if this team would have failed again, because for the most part, it's been 
the same group of players that you've entrusted that have not been able to get the job done. And if you look at the, what the GM has done, you know, going into this off season, how much more would you expect the GM to do without putting the skates on and actually going out and playing? Yeah. So, um, I, you know, I, I've always said it wouldn't have been if they lost, it would have been how they would have lost. And I'm so grateful and thankful that we were actually not having that conversation yeah. because what really stood out to me is how much emotion you saw in the GM and in the coach in the games that they won. And it just truly shows how much they care and how much they love their jobs of, you know, being able to be leaders on this team, both in the GM position and the coach. It, it, it also shows a lot of relief and how much pressure was on their shoulders. Let's see if we can take a look oh, at a couple, of, sure. a couple of pictures here. Let's see. I, uh, look at this. Yeah. Look at this. Yeah. Sure. Look at this. And for we have sure. one of Sheldon Keefe, I think. Oh, yeah. Look like at that. <laughs> I mean, and, and, that, and that's the thing. Like, wow. You know, and, and the people, you know, they, they say what they want to say, you know, that Toronto is celebrating like they won a Stanley Cup. Unless you're here, you don't know what it feels like because it's it's been, it's been uh, excruciating the last couple yeah. of years, especially having to do the post-mortem every year with the, with the, the same story, even though it's a different year. And when you watch John Tavares score that, score that goal and you watch the elation in a player like him and Marner in Matthews, yeah. you know, Riley, and then you see, you know, the, the celebration from Dubis and, and Keith, and then you see the way the fans react and all these videos that, that I've been able to uh, accumulate of people's reactions when that goal went in. It, it's almost – it was the same feeling almost everybody shared where they look up into the skies and they thank the gods because it finally happened. Yeah. They were finally able to experience some joy in being a fan of this team. And, you know, I've got, I've got a, a lot of appreciation for that. I've got, you know, yeah. uh, you know, and, and that's honestly what sports is about when, yeah. when you're able to, to embrace in these type of moments. And I just hope for this fan yeah. base, like you'd mentioned, the story continues to to be read and it continues to move on because yeah. um, if it does, you know, it's been a long time since we've seen the streets painted blue and white in this city. Yeah, no, you're right about that. And, and Carlo, you know, I talked about the rebuild and uh, I remember the way Toronto went about it. Obviously you'll probably have a better, uh, better memory because of it's a team that you cover. It's the city in which you live, but if memory serves me well, I mean, the year that Austin Matthews was the number one pick and Patrick Liney went second, uh, I think it was earlier in the year or the year before where they traded away Dion Phaneuf. They traded away Phil Kessel. It was obvious that they were trading away some of their uh, their veteran players, some of their some of their players who can help them win games in the short term, some of their big contracts as well. They were uh, they were clearing the slate there, and um, and then you know you're able to draft first Matthews, fourth Marner, and then I think seventh or eighth, I think was Nylander or whatever yeah. it was. And then the list goes on and on. And, and then you signed John Tavares two years later, right? Yeah, you signed Tavares. And back in 2012, I think that's the year Morgan Riley went fifth. I think it started with him, actually. Mm -hmm. And then you were able to uh, go for a rebuild. And John Tavares, like I wasn't sure whether or not it was the right move. I thought it was a little bit of a, why do you spend $11 million a year for seven years on a player at center ice when you already have centermen like Matthews and uh, in Kadri. But today I look at it and I think you have to say, even if they don't win the cup, I think you have to say it was the right move. Why? Because Tavares propelled them in round one, number one, number two, as great as Austin Matthews is. And some people say it may have caused a little bit of dissension that they gave Tavares the money before they actually negotiated an increase for Matthews. I look at Matthews, as a guy who might be a leader one day, but right now he doesn't lead as much as an O'Reilly or he doesn't lead as much as a Tavares. At least I don't think so. And I think he needed guys like that to be the guys yeah. and for him to just go out there and score goals. Do you, you feel the same way or I, not? I totally agree with that, Tony. And, yeah. I, and, I, and I witnessed it in my own eyes with young players that I played with when they're... Oh, yeah? when they're brought into the league and there's so much expectation from them and then the organization hands them the world, they, they, they want to make them an, an important voice on the team. And, you know, a great, great example of that is my experience playing with Alex Petrangelo. Alex Petrangelo, when he first came into the league, he, you knew he was a budding star and a team that was going through a little bit of a transition wanted to make him an important player on that team. And there was talks about making him the captain 
in his third year in the team. And I was so against it. I was so against it. And it's not because he didn't deserve it. It's because as a young player, there's already enough that you need to focus on, on the everyday things of just continuing your development. The last thing you need to do is be a voice in the room that's being asked to carry on a bigger responsibility when there's other guys in the room that are more than capable of carrying that responsibility. And you can just be a guy that is learning along the way. So they did that. They gave the captaincy to David Backus because he was a guy more established and they allow Alex Petrangelo to be an assistant and just be part of the mix, but still continue on along his pace. And Mm -hmm. I was very adamant with, you know, the same situation in Toronto that was setting itself up with Tavares and Matthews when it was time to name a captain. And a lot of people were saying it's Matthews. It's gotta be Matthews. He's their best player as the future. And I kept saying, Mm -hmm. no, it's not Matthews because you just want Matthews to worry about playing hockey. The guy yeah. best fitted for this role is John Tavares because he's 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 been a leader. He's been a captain on the island. He's a guy that's that knows what what comes with that responsibility. He's a guy that's comfortable being in you know the first guy that people speak to in the media. He's a guy that's the first guy comfortable going into the coach's office yeah. and sorting out the daily plan. And you just have Matthews be a guy that that's that's a complimenting piece. And you know Matthews' time will come. Yeah, uh, as, as he gets older, as he matures, as he sees older guys, you know, approach to the game and their professionalism, and, and no better yeah. guy to learn from right now than Ryan O'Reilly that they brought in. And this isn't no shot at John Tavares either, but yeah. I think he's doing a good job as well too. But it, I think, to me, it's happened at the right pace yeah. right now for them to be where they're at. And, and, and Carlo, I'll take it a step further because we saw it in Montreal to a lesser degree, obviously, with Max Pacioretty, who was a thirty-five. Uh, 36, 37 goal scorer who had, you know, the weight of the C on his chest. And obviously I'm not comparing the two. I mean, everyone knows that Austin Matthews is two different categories than Matt, than Max Pacioretty at the very least with all due respect to Max. But when you're a goal scorer and you have that pressure of scoring goals and you're playing in a big market in a big hockey market with all that media, it's already a lot to take in. And I'm going to say this about John Tavares. I'll add to what you said. John Tavares, if he would feel the pressure of the C, and let's just say, you know, he wasn't producing to expectations, probably less goals than people thought, but maybe less points than people thought, he's still of a lot of value to a team because he still does a lot of things, right? right. He could still be like a very good 200-foot player. He right. could probably score 10 less goals. He could probably... He can lead by example in, other, in many ways. You're, you're right about that. Okay, in ending, because I so appreciate your, t- your time, and I know you Anytime, have to buddy. wake Anytime. up at 4 o'clock in the morning tomorrow, <laughs> and you got, you got one eye on the screen now with six minutes to go in period number three. Yeah. The Devils lead the Rangers, and I had money on the Rangers to win the cup, and they can go s- fly a kite yeah. uh, because I'm upset at them. All right, okay. Me both. I just thought it was a great value bet, but anyway, that's why I'm stupid. Um... I'll end it with this. Morgan Riley, as a guy who played defense, a lot of great players in that series, obviously. Probably nobody played better than Morgan Riley. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. And Morgan Riley was a very polarizing player, you know, uh, two months into the left into the season and even the leading, you know, last couple of games in the season because he just didn't play to his capability. And what people fail to understand and that's that's being in this market where there's an expectation for who you are and how much you make is this guy had a a knee injury in the middle of the season and it wasn't you know as easy as snapping the fingers to find your rhythm again it took him some time to find his rhythm and you know the, the tough thing for this Maple Leafs team too was they knew who they were playing in December mm-hmm. and you know as much as there was like 30 to 40 games left you know, sometimes when you know what's in front of you, um, you sort of ease your way into it. And and I think for Morgan Riley, that's how his play was looking. But he's been everything as advertised and everything we knew that he could be in this playoff round. You talk about elevating your game to, you know, uh, being one of the best defensemen in the series. I mean, he'll be badly outplayed any defenseman on that Tampa Bay that includes Hedman and Sergachev. And he showed everybody that, you know, he's a guy that can be counted on to lead this team, which is exactly what he did. You know, you see the big goals that he scored and, um, you know, with, with, with how much passion that he played with. I mean, those black eyes that he, that he wears means everything. And I think the other important thing too, is that he found a, a stabilizing partner because there was a lot of musical chairs 
you know, on defense in the, in the later part of the season. And what an addition Luke Shen has been to this team. Yeah. Got to yeah. Back and really finding a nice role and settling in nicely and has really established, you know, a nice comfort playing alongside Morgan Riley to allow him to play his game with more confidence, knowing that he's got a guy that's just going to be, you know, a stabilizing force back, back there doing the simple things and always being in the right position. So I think the combination of those two has allowed Morgan Riley to just find his game again and really be an important piece of this team because he's always been, it's just, we people have been waiting for him to, to, to take his game to this type of level. And it's, yeah. it's fun to watch. It's fun to watch. Uh, it's now three, nothing for the devils. And if I could, uh, with five minutes to go on regulation, and if I cash out my bet of the Rangers to win the cup, I could actually cash out 30 cents. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than zero, right? <laughs> hey, Carlo, uh, he's the guy who uh, Keith Kachuk told yeah. back on March 29th that the Florida Panthers were just too soft and they didn't have a lot of fight in them, unlike his son, um, Brady's Ottawa Senators, who had less talent but did. And ever since then, I mean, the, the the Florida Panthers went on to win six straight games. They started that night on March 29th with Brandon Montour scoring the game winner in overtime. Yeah. Uh, he's still continued to be hot. They finished the season six and two in those last eight, and they end up knocking off the Boston Bruins. It's one of those years, Carlo, and good for you for getting Keith Kachuk to say that. He was uh, the turning <laughs> point in uh, the Florida Panthers season, and hopefully yeah. uh, they're not going to be too hot against the Toronto Maple Leafs. Hey, Enjoy it. Thank you. Have fun with it because, um, you know, I know as a former Leaf, uh, you're feeling a tremendous amount of pride, and and this is uh, this is kind of like your victory too. And I'm happy for you. So yeah, I, I appreciate it's that. It's a, it's yeah. a lot of fun, you know, when you're talking about positive things, and it's it's there's there's happy places around you. And right now, yeah, Toronto is a happy place to be, and you just hope it continues. I apologize if I kept you seven or eight minutes longer. Nah, than you're I, all good, I would. You're all good. This is this is your fault. You're too good at what you do. You got to be less interesting. <laughs> I just love having fun, man. It's all good. It's fun talking. Have a good night. Fun being on with you. Appreciate my, it. Man. My regards work. to the family, and I'm happy to hear that the little guy is doing much better. Take care. Thank okay. You. All right. Thank you're very welcome. All right. There you have it, Carlo Kuliakovo of uh, TSN 1050 in Toronto. We bring in our guys, the regular collaborator, of course, every Monday night. He is a Sportsnet at Sportsnet.ca. Eric Engels, I thank you for waiting a little bit longer because I was supposed to get to you about five or six minutes ago. So, uh, wow, so much to talk about since we spoke last. But the Boston Bruins are gone. The Colorado Avalanche are gone. And the New York Rangers are five minutes away from being gone. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I picked New Jersey to win their series. I picked Toronto to win theirs. Uh, I picked Boston to win the Cup. So I don't feel like a genius right now. Uh, I didn't pick Boston to win the cup. Uh, I actually, I had, I had two picks to win the cup. If I can, you know, only one uh, team can win though, right? I know that. So one okay. pick was my value pick, which was the Rangers. I thought they were like, I got them to like 14 to one. I said, wow, this is a great bet. Um, but um, I just, I just didn't think Boston was going to win the cup because I thought they were the best team. I thought they were the deepest team. But I thought they gave too much in the regular season. And in the end, I mean, if I was they right did? anywhere, at least I was oh, right Oh, you mean like they, like, like they put too much into the regular too season? Too much into the okay. regular season, I think. So look, for example, I mean, uh, case in point, I mean, Patrice Bergeron didn't have to play that last regular season game of the year in Montreal. And ultimately, he plays and he ends up herniating his disc. You know, like... Um, I would I assume, by the way, and maybe this is an even bit, like bigger point. I don't. I highly doubt that he just herniated his disc in that game. I hear you. Um, of course, I would assume actually even more reason that he probably should have been sitting out of that game is that of course something was looming, and that probably got you know a little bit worse within that game. Anyways, crazy collapse. And you know what? I have been thinking a ton about. I was really thinking about the Bruins losing the night before the Bruins lost. And I'll tell you why, because, and I know, I feel like for sure you've seen this clip and discussed it by now, but the clip of yeah. Giannis with the reporter. Yeah. You know what I'm oh, talking man. about, right? Wait till you hear my take on this one. Well, I, I've got well, one. All right. I, so I'll, 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 I'll try and paraphrase what the reporter asked and what Janice answered. Well, the, the, the direct question that the reporter asked, very direct yes. question was, do you view this season as a failure? And 
for anybody who's not a basketball fan, which I'm sure there's plenty of hockey fans watching this, yeah, the Bucks were favored to beat the Heat. They lost in the opening round of the playoffs. Giannis yeah. is considered to be one of the best players in the world, um, and there is a debate whether or not he'll be considered yes. to be the greats of all time. Um, you know, as his, his as his career unfolds. So go ahead. And then Janice answered something to the effect of, "Eric, you asked me the same question last year, Eric. The, 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 there's no failure in sports, Eric. There's no failure. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Sometimes your best is good enough. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's your turn. Sometimes it's not your turn. I, uh, I, I don't want to lack respect with you, but uh, Eric." You get a promotion every year. You, you do you do you get a promotion every year? No, nope. right? Okay, so is a, is a failure, Eric? Because you know you work to 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 try and get the promotion. You to, to try and make more money. To 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 try and buy a house for your family. To to try and help your parents. Huh? you you everything you do, Eric. You you build towards something. Huh? sports is is the same thing. Eric. you build M Michael Jordan. He won six championships, right there. He won six championships, but he played 15 years. The other nine years is a failure, Eric. It's not. It's not a failure. You you build towards something, huh? Uh, between 1971 and and uh, and uh, last year, uh, everything uh, we do with Milwaukee is a failure. No, it's not a failure. We build, and uh, last year we were lucky to win. And hopefully one day we're going to win another one. Tony, this is what makes you honestly one of the most unique people with a microphone in front of you. This is this is the stuff that we have always tuned in for. Thank you. I love Thank it. You. That was better or, than just or the nothing devils situation. right now, by the way. A complete failure by the Red, by the Rangers. Okay. So, <laughs> so I have to love to have your take on this one. The night before game seven. I have one. I have you one. thought the Bruins are losing this game. I thought a lot about Giannis and what he said that day. And I, and I want to say that there was a lot of reaction to it, right, across the sporting yeah. world. Um, yeah. And the reaction overwhelmingly was that it was an extremely poignant, intelligent comment, well thought, the type of role model you would want your kids to look after. And all of that is undeniable. But it was also deflection. And... My take on it is that there's nothing wrong with admitting failure. Failure is tied to success. There is a line between those two things, and they're not mutually You, you think exclusive. Janice absolves himself of any responsibility by answering the way he did? I don't think he absolves himself of responsibility, but he also doesn't own the failure. And yeah. there's something to be said about people who do. And, and are willing to admit failure and accept that failure is not a negative just because it has negative connotation. Failure is a part of the journey, and that speaks to what he was saying, right? Like that there are steps on the road to success. Mm -hmm. One of those steps is failing, and they failed. The Milwaukee Bucks failed. Giannis failed going whatever it was, 11 for 24. For I, the I agree line. with you 100%. And by the way, Eric, the reporter, he doesn't make forty million dollars a year to deliver a championship. To no, his, and he kind of bailed. He kind of bailed because I, I and I don't know who that reporter is. I haven't looked it up. Yeah, and he asked a very fair question for anybody who's pitting it as he's trying to have a gotcha moment. I think Mark Cuban framed it that way. That is absolutely not what happened there. There is a debate that has been raging in basketball since Giannis burst onto the scene, and he was a Finals MVP at one point as to whether or not he will go down as one of the greats or if he's one of the greatest regular season players of all time or if he really has that clutchness within him to deliver in the big moments. And that question is a question to try to get inside Giannis's mind and find out, do you have that championship or bust mentality, that win or nothing mentality, mm -hmm. that gold or nothing Team Canada type mentality? And the irony of his answer, and this is what really stuck with me, is he brings up Michael Jordan and he says, exactly as you put it in your incredible impersonation. Um, <laughs> I think it was know, a great six, answer, by the six, way. By great the way. answer. Six yeah. out of 15 years, the guy won a championship. Does that make him a failure in the other nine? And what I didn't like from the reporter was him saying, no. I would have loved for him to say, why don't you ask Michael Jordan that question? He'll answer it for you. Because anybody who knows Michael Jordan, we could all answer it for him because we know what Michael Jordan would say. 
he would have considered his situation to be a colossal failure in the years that he didn't win a championship. And especially if he was knocked out in the first round as the favorite in the series. Mm -hmm. Um, That's what made Michael Jordan the most dominant basketball player of all time. And look, I don't want to keep going around in circles here. No, you're right. Michael Jordan. Let's let's bring it back to the Bruins. Let's Let's go back to the Bruins. Yes. Let's bring it back to the Bruins. The greatest regular season in NHL history. Yeah. And if it's not, then it's second to Montreal in, you know, 76, 77. Fine. Okay. Those guys lost eight games all year, but 65 win season. And, and considering it's a 32 team league and the travel and everything that goes into it, I have no problem as a native Montrealer saying it is the greatest regular season in NHL history, what the Bruins just did. And I could promise you that if you ask Patrice Bergeron... Statistically speaking, but no, it's not because the Montreal Canadiens didn't play at a time where if you lose a game, you get a point. Right. In fine. overtime, right? But for me, it, it is. Just the conditions, fine. Like, okay. And, and anyways, if it's not number one, it's number two. Who cares? Yeah, yeah, I don't have a problem with it. I don't have a problem with it. You're right. But the bottom line is if you ask Patrice Bergeron or, or, or Brad Marchand that question last night, if you said, how do you view this season? Do you view this season as a failure? By the way, I would have preferred the question be... be not a yes or no proposition. Just ask, how do you view this season in terms of failure versus success? That's a that's a more open that's a, kind that's of a, that's, question. That's a great way of asking that yeah. question. I also would have asked him, by the way, um, can you begin to explain to me why you weren't able to elevate the way you've shown us in the past that you can? Sure. Like try great. to, you know, like just. Both questions would have been fair. Yeah. Both questions are fair questions, and they are questions to lead a reporter to be able to write one of two stories. A, that if you don't think Giannis takes this as a complete failure and, and as a win or nothing kind of mentality as the New Jersey Devils just parked the New York Rangers. Yeah, it's like, over. If, if, if you didn't if if I could if I was that reporter asking that question, I would love to be able to write that story about Giannis and be like, all, the, all you people who think that he's not one of those guys, he is, and look at how he views this this failure. It is a failure. He owns it. If you ask the Bruins, if you ask Marchand, if you ask Bergeron, who I think are great champions, um, you know, no matter how many cups they've won, they've won. Um, they would, if you ask them how they're going to view this season, man, I, they're going to say they they don't even want to look back on it ever again. I mean, like, yeah, yeah, that's that's brutal what happened three chances to eliminate the last entrant to the stanley cup playoffs and i'm not taking anything away from florida they deserve to win the series three chances a 3-2 lead in the third period the greatest team that we've seen in a regular season in a very long time and a team that was absolutely built to go all the way and win the stanley cup because you know what outside of tampa that had that 62 win season and lost every other team that's had a comparable season to what the Bruins just did. And there's not a mm-hmm. lot of them have won the Stanley cup. <coughs> like it's a failure. I, it, it is a failure. And those guys would call it a failure and own it as a failure. And it'll make them stronger moving forward. But man, you, you added, yeah. Orlov, you added Hathaway, you added uh, Bertuzzi. Bertuzzi. I mean, like, that's a great pickup. And the team was worthy of a championship before those three players came in. You yeah, know, like it, it, that's what I was thinking about last night watching that. I was thinking about Giannis. I was thinking about that answer that everybody praised universally. That was a deflection instead of yeah. owning failure and reframing a failure as part of the yeah. success, which he did in a roundabout way, but didn't own the failure part. And I think the Bruins will. I think they will. Uh, you know, there's a lot of champions on that team, and they will own what happened. And and when you ask them next year how they view last season, they will say, "I don't want to think about last season." Because yeah. that's a rough way to go out. Man, the images of this, the Rangers in this handshake line are unbelievable. You gotta, you gotta feel for Gerard Gallant. I mean, it's just, uh, but at the same time, I mean, um, they're on the upswing. Team, it is, yeah, but his team just they, they. There's like three games out of their four losses. There's like three of the four losses. They laid eggs. Like they weren't even, they weren't even in it. Like it was, it was bad. Like, and uh, it, it shows. You I don't know if he's, I don't know if he's going to continue if this with this team. Like, I mean, uh, at one point he had a cab waiting for him. He might have a skateboard waiting outside tonight. Like, I, I don't know, man. Like, this is. I don't, I don't think it's on him. Like, I think the Rangers tinkered a little bit too much with the chemistry that they have and changed their DNA a little bit with what they brought in. 
Um, you know, their skill is tremendous, undeniable. Yeah. And but you know, to do that type of surgery with those type of profile players, yeah. It's easy to sit here and say they shouldn't have done it. I mean, it's pretty exciting when you get to add guys like Tarasenko and Kane. Yeah. Uh, champions. But Good man, for Lady Ruff, by the way. So we got an appointment here. The Devils versus the Hurricanes and the Maple Leafs versus the Panthers. Good for Lindy Ruff, by the way, the head coach of the New Jersey Devils, yeah. who has one of the greatest nicknames in the history of hockey. Go for it. You don't know what it is? You know what it is. No, you tell us. Rough at home, Lindy on the road. <laughs> <laughs> His season started with them chanting "Fire Lindy." I know it's unbelievable. They, they, what a season! You know, if the Canadians can resemble the Devils in about a year or two, I mean that there'll be no complaints. I mean, they were they were really fun to watch. Hey, by the way, did you hear something about the NHL draft lottery today? Did I, anybody I know, whisper anything in your ear? I know it's May eighth. Guess what? It may not be. Really. Yeah, I had somebody very, very close to the situation. Now, it, it, it may be, but tomorrow the National Hockey League is going to make a decision because it is possible, possible, that they actually change the date to Tuesday, May 9th, the day oh, after. Don't ask me why. Yeah. I don't know. But this coming from someone in the know, there's likely going to be. So if you don't hear, if you hear something tomorrow about the draft lottery, it's because it was changed to Tuesday, May 9th. If you don't hear nothing tomorrow about the draft lottery, it's staying Monday, May 8th. Well, at least but, it's coming, uh, at least it's coming soon. Uh it definitely, it definitely is. Yes. Uh so that Florida pick is not going to be as great as the Canadians would have wanted it to be, right? It could be. It could be. If they lose to Toronto, it'll still if, be the 17th pick. Correct. If they lose to Toronto, it could still be the 17th pick. Yeah. But they might not lose to Toronto. Everybody's already ready to anoint the Leafs and say that the, the road is paved for them. I said it before. I'm going to say it again. I'm not scared. To say, it's Toronto's cup to lose. Yeah, well, I mean, whenever they've been in that type of favorable position, it hasn't worked out that great for them. I'm not I'm not knocking off the, the Panthers after It's a different Toronto Panthers. team this year. I think Toronto will win too. Yeah. But they better play a lot better than they did against Tampa because you know what? This year was different about the Leafs. You know what was different about it? They weren't the better team for arguably four of the seven games and managed to win them. Yeah. That's something that they have not been able to do in the but last But that sign of teams years. teams that win Stanley Cups, they do that too, right? They find a way to win games. I know, but they also turn up the gas, man, and they better step on it against Florida because if they don't, they're going to get smacked in the face. They better yeah, step no, on it. I think I, they're going to win also. I think yeah. they're going to win the series. But if they play the same way they did in the last one, they won't. Yeah, but you know what? At the same time, who am I? Like, I thought the Rangers had all the pieces to go very, very. I thought the Rangers could have won the cup this year. I'm once again, I'm well, going to say it until I'm blue. It is. I'm going to say it until I'm blue in the face. Shesterkin in goal on defense. Braden Schneider, Keandre Miller, Jacob Truba, Adam Fox. They didn't play um, that nasty brand that we saw last year. They just never in in Lindgren. all seven games they never played that way. No, not one. Center one-on-one. Ice, Shittle, Trocheck, um, Zabinajad, Zabinajad on the wings, Panarin, Tarasenko, Kreider, Kane. Kane. Yeah, third line wingers, Lafreniere and Kako. Like I, I don't. They were built to go, but chemistry they, matters, and you yeah. can't play like an all star team in the playoffs. You got to Toronto. Toronto, you gotta get your nose dirty. And 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 that part of me, the Devils found the goalie who got hot. I mean, who would have thought they got they got beat by a third string goalie who's standing on his head? This guy's like Steve Penny all over again, man. There's a name from the past. Eh? See, he's going to get tested against Carolina, man. They they play a game that New Jersey did not see. The Rangers were equipped to play that game and didn't play it once. They played it all last playoffs, and they knew that they were being underestimated. You know, they went all in on the skill and. They were missing a lot of the jam, despite the fact that it was dressed in their lineup. We saw it from Truba tonight with that hit on Meyer, which people are complaining about. It was a great hit. <sighs> Guys, I think, you know what's interesting about this new generation of Hawks? It's a great hit. I'm not, I'm not even going to denigrate them. 
they don't want this in the game anymore. They just don't want it in the game anymore, and that's fine. Then the rules need to change to accommodate that. But the rules are what they are, and this generation is so not used to seeing players get hit in open ice that even the players themselves are not used to it and leave themselves prone to getting hit. The, the hits that Truba has thrown this year, if you go back and look at all of them, like it's like these players are playing a style like they don't even expect to get hit because it never happens. But Truba is the only guy on that Rangers blue line outside of Ryan Lindgren that played with the type of jam that you need in the playoffs, and nobody up front did it. I mean, nobody up front, they, they, they were not in the middle of the ice and owning the middle of the ice despite the advantage they had in terms of the versatility of their roster. And when you see what they pulled off in the playoffs last year and go back and watch those games, they played with true grit and passion. Oh, yeah. They'll learn from it. They'll learn from it and come yeah. back. I don't, I don't think it's on Gallant. I think, you know, from yeah. a GMing perspective and jury, uh, again, it's easy to Monday morning quarterback it, but at the same yeah. time, there was a question as to whether or not they're loading up on the things that are not necessarily what really get you through, despite the fact that both those guys were, were champions. It, the podcast wouldn't be a podcast if I didn't bring up Pierre-Luc Dubois' name. Um, you yeah. saw what Rick Bonus had to say at the end of the last game, at the end of that series. He was obviously targeting his better players. He was obviously targeting Connor, um, Wheeler, and Dubois. To a lesser extent, Shifley, who missed the last game. To a lesser extent, Morrissey, who missed the last two. To a lesser extent, Hellebuck, because he talked about pushback and he talked about fighting. You can just tell he was talking about his forwards. Uh, Dubois, once again, uh, Wheeler, and Kyle Connor in particular. Um, but you also saw um, the general manager come out and say, Rick Bonus' job is safe. He'll be back next year, which leads you to believe that that core, there's going to be two or three players that are going to be gone. There's been a lot of speculation already about Pierre-Luc Dubois. Your buddy Elliot Freeman of Sportsnet, Sportsnet.ca, has already told us probably a couple of months ago that a 95% Pierre-Luc Dubois will end up being a Montreal Canadian sooner or later. Um, what do you make of Dubois' playoffs or the playoffs he had? Up and down. Marc Antoine Godin, uh, you know, I have no problem giving props to my colleagues. And Marc Antoine Godin, yeah. uh, the Athletic, wrote a good piece today about this. That you know, if you're Kent Hughes and you're contemplating trading for Pierre Luc Dubois, you have to consider the the flags that are there as well. You know, like you can't just look at the, the blueprint. But his conclusion of the piece was, yeah, this is a piece worth worth adding. This is a piece that makes you better and gives you a better chance of winning and winning mm -hmm. sooner. And I agree 100%. I, 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 the big difference with Dubois and Montreal is that he wants to be here. And he can deny whether or not that's true or whatever it is. But, you know, it's not just Elliot and not just because Pat Brisson said what he said at the draft. Um, it's not just Elliot Friedman who knows that, you know, he has an interest in playing for Montreal. Did he have an interest in playing for Winnipeg? I think that's made pretty clear by the way he performed there when it mattered most. You know, it was his heart fully in it. Mm, I don't know. And that but is a red that, flag. That's a, that's a red flag in itself, it Eric. It okay, is. Let's, it is just say, There's no let's, denying. Just say, let's just say I'm working Columbus radio, right? And, uh, you know, all of a sudden I, I end up out of a job and my next job is in Winnipeg working Winnipeg radio. Am I not going to give my best day in and day out because I don't want to be in Winnipeg? I mean, for me, that's a red flag, man. That is a red flag. I get it. And I'm not, I don't want to, I kind of want to reverse on what I said because I don't think it's exactly what I meant to say. I'm not suggesting that he didn't try. It's just there's a difference between having the passion for, for who you're playing for like a true passion for it and and his situation where he was essentially, you know, he's working for his employer and doing the best he can under the circumstances, but is he committed to the market? I mean, I don't think so. Jonathan maybe, Drew, maybe, wanted, maybe, and here maybe, we go again with Jonathan Drew, and you're going to say, yeah. please don't compare the two, but no, uh, for the sake of talk, Jonathan no. Drew wanted out of Tampa 
And we were told by people close to the situation that Jonathan Drouin was going to be at his very best in Montreal because he was a big-time pressure player. He wanted to be a Montreal Canadian, and he was going to thrive on being a Montreal Canadian. It didn't work out. That doesn't mean it's not going to work out for Pierre-Luc Dubois, but, you know, when Aaron Portsline, who knows the Columbus Blue Jackets like the back of his hand, joins me on the SICK podcast and says, by the way, that shift where Dubois dogged it for 20 seconds, you have to understand that Dubois had put in a trade request on a couple of occasions and made it clear that he wanted to go to Montreal. And because they didn't take his trade request seriously, and because he had heard that Columbus wanted to retain him and match any offer sheet that would have come their way, that he decided to dog it for a 20-second shift because that was his message to management that if you're not going to trade me, I'm going to perform like this so you'll have no other choice. That's a big red flag, Eric. Yeah, but that's like the stuff that we know. That is that is a a fraction of what like the real whole picture is. That's the issue. Okay. We don't have all the information, okay? Let's not pretend we you're do. Right. Uh, that's quite informative from Aaron. We have other information in terms of what Dubois' interest level is and this and that. The guy had a pretty damn good season. And when they were good in these playoffs, which was for a fraction of the time also, mm -hmm. he was their best player. There are red flags, but there's a lot of green ones too. And I could tell you, I don't have to make this decision. Ken Hughes does when the time comes and he could decide whether or not he's going to trade something to get the asset or if he's going to sign him and mm -hmm. what he would actually sign him to, which was the point that Mark Antoine Godin was making was that he would add him to the team yeah. too, but not at just any cost. Um, I'm a believer that if you have Nick Suzuki and Kirby Doc and Cole Caulfield and Pierre-Luc Dubois and people well, who's going to play center and who's going to play wing? And You're a better team and have a better chance of winning with one of them transposed to the wing than none of them. You're a better team. You have a better yeah, team. Yeah, I hear you. Yep. This game is one up the middle. Nobody talks about Team Canada and how Braden Point would be playing on the wing with Sidney Crosby. Like, you do whatever you got to do, and when you need to spread it, like Toronto can with O'Reilly. Like Toronto can because it. they put O'Reilly with Tavares early on, and now they got O'Reilly centering the third line. I think that Pierre-Luc Dubois, if he ends up being a Montreal Canadian, that Ken Hughes will have to handle that, like Marc-Antoine Godin suggested in his column, as yeah. making sure that the money makes sense, yeah, that the contract makes sense. Yeah. But I also think he's going to give them a much better chance of winning the Stanley Cup. And those red flags that existed in Columbus yeah. and Winnipeg, I'll take those with a bit of a grain of salt in terms of what they would mean in Montreal I, because he wants to be here. Yeah. And, 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 and that's until potentially he proves everybody wrong and resigns gotcha. with Winnipeg. You know, like, I, I don't yeah. know. For We can't say with 100% certainty yeah, that you know he still wants to be a Montreal Canadian when all is said and done. We'll see. We'll see how much he really wants it because they're not. I don't believe going to give him ten million dollars a year to do it. So we'll see. I hope not. I hope not. A shout out to well, I hope for him, yes, but I hope not uh, for the team. A uh, shout out to Matrix Home Fitness. Discover a club quality workout in the comfort of your own home. Visit MatrixHomeFitness.ca. The treadmill, the elliptical, the the uh, the rower. Uh, have the machine in your home, and you're absolutely going to love them. All right. Okay. An ending. Jonathan Marchessault, and I saw this uh, somewhere, uh, said in an interview, actually, it's Stevia Spa, that um, in his opinion, in his opinion, uh, he told my buddy Jean-Charles Lajoie earlier uh, this evening that um, out of all the Winnipeg players, he thought that Pierre-Luc Dubois was the best player on the ice every night. He says he was working really hard. Uh, he implicated himself very much physically and he says, honestly, I have nothing but good words for him. So that's good. Yeah, that's, that's cool. That's, that's fair. I would agree with the assessment also. And I would I would also suggest that nobody was good in that last game. No one. That's true, too. And Rick Bonus absolutely should have said what he said to the media, to his team before saying it. But there's nothing wrong with what he said. And I have no issue with him saying it in the media. 
And I think he expressed it several times, his frustration through the second half of the season with that group. And that group, to me, is checked out. Well, I also it it ain't just Pierre Luc Dubois. It it is like yeah, Wheeler, Hellebuck, all of them. Not only do they not believe that it's going to stick together, but it sounds like they don't believe it should stick together. Yeah, and you know what? I know a lot of people aren't going to like what Rick Bonus said because they're probably going to say that he should have said it to his team. And uh, you know what? It's a uh, whatever. Here's the deal. I believe he said what he said, A, because he really felt that that was the case. But B, I think he had assurances that they were going to go, they were going to continue with him as coach, but that they were going to blow up this team and that yeah, two, or three, two, two or like, three players were going to be gone. I don't think he cares. I think he was Maybe saying not. It because, I think he was saying it to emphasize that change is needed. Yeah. And, and he's under contract, so he has no reason to think otherwise that he's not going to be there. Um, but I don't think he cares. Rick Bonus has had a long enough career uh, in the NHL with plenty of security that if for whatever reason that was going yeah. to be the end for him, if they were to choose him, uh, the players over him or whatever it is, or opt to keep everything status quo, he wouldn't want to be there. Yeah. Why did Eric, Paul Maurice leave? Eric, always a lot of fun. So as of tonight, your Stanley Cup final is? I don't know. Uh, first of all, I want to mention, I'm going to be writing about Carolina and New Jersey. I'm not not going to cover the series uh, in those cities, but I will be writing okay. some stuff on that um, at Sportsnet. I really like the Hurricanes. Yeah. I really I like, the like the Hurricanes. Whether or not they have the offense to get it done is a question, but the style they play is punishing, and they've had a bit of rest going into the next series, which I think will be beneficial for them. I like Toronto to move past Florida, but like I said, they better play a lot better. Like they, I like Carolina to win. I like Toronto to win. And in the they, West, you have? I have Dallas going to the final. I, I, I honestly I have to see who comes out of the East. Yeah. But I, I like Dallas's chances of winning the Cup. All right. I love their goalie. I love their physicality. The, what they're getting out of Sega is great considering he's no longer their best offensive player. You need depth scoring. Pavelski could be back at some point soon here. Yeah. And um, I just Hintz love is that excellent. team. I just thought yeah. that team just plays playoff hockey and they just faced a massive physical challenge and ran it yeah. over. Uh, yes. I, I, they're going to be a force to contend with for whoever goes up against them. The other, ser- you know, the Edmonton situation is real interesting. We'll see where we'll see how far they get. They're going to be hard to stop. They're going to be I'll hard. Take, to- I'll take Edmonton tonight, May first. Uh, I will tell you that I have uh, Toronto beating Dallas, uh, but once again, I had the Rangers. So what the hell do I just know? underestimate the Panthers at your own peril? Because I'll tell you that team was nowhere near as bad as they showed through the first half of the season. Analytically, it was very clear that something was going to reverse here, and then it yeah. did. And that was a galvanizing win against an unbelievable team. And and they deserve to win. And my question is in their net. But considering what Bobrovsky looked like last night, yeah. And I know they got three goals by him, but they're the Bruins. Speaking of the Bruins, man, I know we're 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 hanging up and getting done here. Yeah, it's okay. I have nowhere the to one, go. The one thought that I had while I was watching OT was I can't believe we haven't seen a shift of Bergeron, Marshawn, and Pasternak together. And then I went and looked it up on Natural Statric, and I know Bergeron missed, was it the first four games of the series, right? Yeah, yeah. They played 6-16 together at even strength through the three games he was healthy. And I know they were spread throughout the season, and I know they moved, you know, Pasternak was playing great, Gima. The season's on the line. You're going to overtime. You have the best line in the last five years, like to put together. You don't do it for a single shift. It's crazy to me. Yeah. He obviously wanted to spread it out, but I understand your point and I agree with you. And if it's true that Allmark was playing with a devastating injury, as uh, you know, Kevin Weeks reported. Yeah. The hell was he doing in the net for six games? And, and Kevin when Weeks, split, is pretty, when and Kevin Weeks, are pretty connected. He, he, he's got he's got pretty good people with Spriggan. I don't, well. I don't doubt it. I'm just saying, like, yeah, yeah. What the 
what the hell is he doing in the net for six games when he hasn't right. looked good the entire series and you were going with the platoon all season? Yeah. Just makes no sense. Anyways. I mean, look, I, I don't I don't think that um, they lost this series because they went with Swayman last night. Now, uh, I would have told you, I would have told you that I would not have made the goalie change last night, but now that I find out that Allmark was not at a hundred percent and hurt, then I would have. But no, they would have won it know. in six games if Swayman had played in the sixth one. Maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. <laughs> but the Panthers should not best be underestimated. Player in that series was Matthew Kachuk, man. He was the best player in that series. Yeah, and he's been one of the best players in the world for a few years now. People are like, oh, yeah. you know, this is just his year. Like, yeah, there's a reason they traded for him and traded. Hey, was Montour Peter good? Huber oh, my now. God. Is Brandon Montour good or what? Wow. No, I always thought he was amazing in Anaheim and then went to Buffalo and was like, what's wrong with this guy? And Because I always thought he was unbelievable. And, but, I, and I, I've been a Verhage fan since Chicago, and he came up big, obviously, with the biggest goal of the series that he scored last yeah. night in overtime. What do you have, 43 point difference between the Panthers and the Bruins represents the largest upset in the Stanley Cup playoffs history for a best of seven series. An upset for the ages, and you can find that at SN Stats for Sportsnet. As I have one eye on Sportsnet right now, and it Verhage just, had what 45 goals this year, 41 goals. 40 Verhage can score goals, man. He's got a lethal 42 wrist shot. goals, lethal wrist shot. Pretty good player, pretty good player. And and, and you know what, wasn't Biggest play of the series. Biggest play of the series before he scored that goal, which he's known for scoring goals, was winning that battle on Orlov in the corner to tie the game. On, the, on that faceoff with 128 left, with uh, Bennett darting to the corner, yeah. and Verhage just hounding Orlov and getting the puck back. The Bruins won the, the faceoff. That was the biggest play of the game. The biggest play in the series, oh, yeah. besides Verhage scoring the overtime winner, was probably Brad Marchand missing a breakaway with like one second left in regulation. I know. Crazy. That was pretty Eight harsh. Too. That Eric, right there. We'll talk to you soon, man. Cheers. Take care. All right. There you have it. Eric Engels of Sportsnet and Sportsnet.ca. We're going to get to a couple of your questions before I break away and I say goodnight, even though I've already gone seven minutes of overtime. But that's okay because, you know what, I can always go seven minutes longer. Um. That's not a problem, by the way. Uh, okay. Um, other than that, I'll say that. Um, and I'll, so I'll get to a couple of questions, uh, and I'll get to them via YouTube. And some of you are asking questions via YouTube. And if you want to ask me anything, go ahead. Uh, I'll do this for a couple of minutes. I'll also take the opportunity to give a shout out to my buddy Charlie over at Optimal Stretch, who specializes in fascia stretch therapy. One of very few in Montreal, one of very few in the province of Quebec, and uh, there aren't too many uh, in Canada, period. He's at Optimal Stretch Clinic. You can check them out on Instagram at 4710 St. Ambroise in St. Henry, room 312. He is uh, just, he's got hands of gold. Uh, all right, okay, uh, via YouTube, I have a couple here. Um uh, if Olmark stayed in the net in Game 5, Boston would have won. Yeah, maybe. This coming in from K-Wolf, but they didn't. Others coming in. Leafs, Oilers, Cup Final, says Enforcer. I think it's definitely a possibility, but I'm going to go with Leafs, Stars. But I could see Leafs, Oilers happening. I can. Uh, 66 spinning says Boston are out because they missed too many scoring chances. And over time, you know, the Florida Panthers missed a lot of scoring chances, too. Ryan Baker says Bergeron is probably done. Yeah, it looks like he's going to retire. What a career he had, though. Eh? And you know what? As much as some of you probably took pleasure in seeing the Bruins lose, watching Bergeron break down in Brad Marchand's arms at the end, it was something, man. It was it was difficult to watch. It was really something. But who would have thought that the Boston Bruins would have played their worst hockey uh, with Patrice Bergeron coming back in the series in the last three games? But he really was not at 100% at all. Uh, by the way, in case you missed it today, Daryl Sutter, head coach of the Calgary Flames, was relieved of his duties. And a couple of players have actually decided to speak out and say that, uh, you know, I think Bob Hartley reported earlier today that he asked Jonathan Huberto about it, about um, Daryl Sutter. And uh, he said that one of the things that uh, upset the group was when um, Sutter actually downplayed Jacob Peltier's performance in Peltier's first game and said, yeah, what number is he and this and that? And then Huberto said, you know, we were wondering, why would you say that to the media? 
but then actually go to the kid and tell your kid you played well. Like, why would you do that for? So clearly he lost his locker room and the Calgary Flames realized it. And Don Maloney, president of hockey operations and interim GM of the Calgary Flames made the announcement uh, earlier today. So after uh, their general manager, Brad Tree Living, is gone, their head coach, uh, Daryl Sutter, is gone as well. And uh, Frank Saravalli reports that uh, Mitch Love of the AHL, Mitch Love, uh, is actually um, probably in pole position for the job, which led me to tweet out earlier today. Um, you know, over the past couple of years, the Calgary Flames had a coach that uh, showed them tough love. Uh, at some points, he showed them no love at all, and now they might be going to Mitch Love. <laughs> Eric Francis tweet, firing Sutter is the right move. He cost the organization its GM and was poised to cost it so much more by creating an untenable environment for players and staff to work. And that is, uh, once again, uh, coming in via Sportsnet. All right, okay. Um is Grant coming on to recap the under-18 tournament? If all go, will go well, Grant will be one of the people that will join us for the NHL draft lottery, which will take place at least one week from today. Once again, in case you missed it, I said earlier on in the show that even though they announced that it will be on Monday, May 8th, there's a chance, a slight chance, slight chance that it could actually be moved to Tuesday, May 9th. Sammy tells me we have three questions. Sammy, get to them. Hey, T, if Hughes decided to sign Pierre-Luc Dubois, what kind of contract do you think he deserves? Um, less than the captain, Nick Suzuki, who makes $7.875 million. So I hope I've answered your question there. We'll take a couple more. Is Ottinger the best goalie in the National Hockey League still in the playoffs? I would say yes. This coming in from the Nature Boy. I don't think it's the real Nature Boy Ric Flair, but I believe it is somebody who is probably a Ric Flair diehard. And if it is the real Nature Boy Ric Flair, Rick, I've spoken to you before in the past. I had you on my radio show back in the day. And uh, I'd love to uh, I'd love to have you on the podcast if you can join me at, uh, at some point. A shout out. To my boy Mario Ruffalo over at Bapore, which is basically um, it's steam and it's being able to clean any surface without the need for harsh chemicals. You can disinfect services, surfaces, pardon me, faster and more efficiently for residential and for commercial, for homes, for hospitals, for old age homes, for schools, you name it. They're at 16, 641 Hymas in Kirkland. And what I love about this ecological dry vapor cleaning technology from VPR Impex, uh, and check out VPR Impex on their Instagram handle, is that the um, basically the brush comes with different attachments. And one of them is a soft brass attachment, which you can hook on and you can put some steam on your barbecue apply the soft brass and then steam again and it will clean up and disinfect the whole surface. Another thing that's pretty cool, you can take the steam hose and you can basically steam your bed, take off the covers or cover on or cover off. And so to get rid of any bed bugs that might be there or whatever. And then if you go to bed immediately after that, the bed's not wet because it kind of like evaporates. It's a terrific product. One more. And then we'll call it a night. Does Bergeron retire? This coming from the last ride? Last ride, I believe it was his last ride. I believe he will retire and he will go down, he will go down as one of the best leaders and one of the best 200-foot players in the history of the National Hockey League. What a pick in 2003. The deepest draft in NHL history. And the player who went in the second round at 45th overall, Patrice Bergeron, ended up being the best player in that draft. In a draft that had so many great players, like Ryan Getzlaff and like Corey Perry and uh, like uh, Marc-Andre Fleury and like uh, Kessler. And, uh, um, you know, there was uh, there were just so many. I think that, um, I think that Patrice Bergeron was the best player of that draft. Eric Stahl was in that draft. Uh, Ryan Suter was in that draft. Um, um, 
did I say Carter? I think I said Carter, but Dustin Brown was in that draft, and Brent Seabrook was in that draft, and Zach Parise was in that draft, and Brent Burns was in that draft, and Mike Richards was in that draft, and he had a pretty good career himself, and uh, Shea Weber was in that draft. But I think that uh, Patrice Bergeron, who went 45th, was the best player from that 2003 draft, the deepest draft in the history of the National Hockey League. I really believe that. And the Canadians fans, uh, don't try and give it too much thought that the Montreal Canadiens, with the 10th pick overall, picked Andre Kostitsin. And with the 40th pick overall, they finally went to the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. And instead of drafting Patrice Bergeron, who was a centerman for Acadie Bathurst, they drafted Corey Urquhart, who was a centerman for the Montreal Rocket. That one hurts. That one hurts. Marinaro. The Sick Podcast. Tell your friends about it. It's getting sicker each and every day. It will be much sicker by next year. We're upgrading everything that we're doing. We're working on it all the time. We're planning a beautiful get together sometime in June. And I am, you know what? I'm looking forward to meeting all of you where I can put face to name and we can chat. Tomorrow night, we'll chat again. Same time, same place, weeknights, 10 p.m. YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Twitter Live. Like it. Share with your friends. Comment SICK, S-I-C-K, S-I-C-K. And if you're going to listen to us on Google, Apple, or Spotify, leave us a five-star review. It's our way of feeling the love. By the way, the SICK podcast has launched, and we did so probably about a month and a half ago, a CF Montreal podcast as well. So if you see that on Twitter, at SICK Pod, C-F-M-T-L, follow it. You've seen it on Instagram. Subscribe to that YouTube channel. That, too, is absolutely free. For Agnello and Sammy and Master Control, their Cavallaro, I'm Marinaro. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the Sick Podcast with Tony Marinaro on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. The Sick Podcast is brought to you by Energy Transportation Group. Driven to be different. La Vida TV. Embrace your true nature. <laughs>